Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. Nah, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah, thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The mom personal assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey, mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Community Church of the Nazarene in Beulah, North Dakota, and Crosswinds Community Church of the Nazarene in New Salem. Thank you for joining us. And in case you didn't know, today is Mother's Day. Thank you to all the mothers out there, for all the people who have taken the role of mothers. We, we thank you for how you have, have helped to, to shape the young, impressionable lives, even through adulthood and, and beyond. Mothers are a vital part of, of who we are. I don't know where I would be without the, the love and the nurture and the reprimanding of my mother. And I am so thankful for my wife as well and, and the mother that she is to our kids. So I would encourage you, if, if you haven't done anything, if you don't already have plans, take this time to love on your mother. Give her a call, give her a hug, whatever, whatever you're able to do. Um, a couple of announcements as we're getting started this morning. Uh, I've had many people asking me about when are we opening the church. Um, I've had many discussions with people in the church, with other pastors around town. Um, there are other churches in our community that opened weeks ago. Some are opening this week or next week. Um, I've, I've been in lots of talks about this. And, and trust me, this is not a decision that has been taken lightly. Uh, I've been in talks with the church board and we've, we've been given the, the green light to, to go ahead, but we've also been getting new cases here in Mercer County, our, our first cases even. And with that being said, we're, we're seeing that we may not be out of the woods. Some of the other areas have already been hit and they're, they're on the downhill, but we may just be getting started. So we're going to be cautious and, and take a couple weeks to just see how things are going and reassess things at the, at the end of May and beginning of June. Because the reality is we were not shut down by the government. We chose to shut down. And so we're also not going to, to reopen just because the government says so. Our primary responsibility is to the people in our church and to our community. And we want to take that responsibility seriously. And so we're going to hold off on, on opening things up for that reason. I also want to point out, I posted on Facebook, but in case you're not on Facebook, um, it has come down from the district leadership that uh, unfortunately our children's uh, kids camp uh, for this summer has been canceled. There's still waiting on word about teen camp, but as far as, as children's camp, we're, we're spanning North and South Dakota as well as Minnesota, and things are just so all over the place um, that they couldn't really, they couldn't really do it or, or make it work, unfortunately. 
And so they're already planning for next year. And so we, we encourage you to continue to, to consider sending your kids next year. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, hopefully they aren't too heartbroken at this. Uh, a couple other quick things. I, as, even as things are beginning to open up and, and things are still, some things are still shut down, I would con- encourage you to continue to, to be involved in the many different ways. Um, in our Wednesday night Zoom meeting here in Beulah at 6.30 p.m., um, my contact information is here. If you, if you want to be involved in that, we would love to have you. Um, send me an email, uh, call, and we will make sure that you get the information needed to, to join us in that. And also the Thursday night parking lot prayer warriors. Uh, gather in the parking lots of uh, the Knife River Care Center here in Beulah or your area hospital. Um, don't get out of your cars. Tune your radio to AM 550. This is at 8 p.m. And have a time of, of prayer for those who are on the front lines, those who are, are battling this pandemic and doing everything they can to keep our community safe. As we're continuing to, to do things online, I would continue to uh, encourage you to, to give online. Uh, paypal.me slash Nazarene. You can go to beulanazarene.com and we have a link up in the upper right hand corner. Um, continue to, to send in your, your checks or, or however you've figured out how to continue your, your tithes and your offerings. Um, because we are still the church. We're still reaching the corners of this globe. We're still building hospitals. We're still helping in remote areas of the world. And we're still continuing to impact our community. Throughout all of this, that's what we need to remember. That no matter what it looks like, even if we have to do social distancing, we are still the church. We are still tasked with with helping those who are in need, with being the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. And so I would encourage you, throughout all the many different avenues and opportunities that we still have available, to continue to be Jesus, to continue to reach out to those in need. At this time... Uh, we will take our, our online offering. Um, uh, I can encourage you to, to get out your phone and, and give online or however, however you've worked out to do that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be called your children and to be a part of your mission. God, may you use this offering to, to reach the corners of the earth. God, may you bless those who give and and use them in your mission, we pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, we have the privilege of worshiping with Harvest Community Church of the Nazarene in Mitchell, South Dakota. Good morning and welcome home to Harvest Community Church of the Nazarene in Mitchell, South Dakota. Uh, We're hoping that today finds you well and healthy, uh, and we are so glad that everyone is joining us, uh, whether you're here, all three of you, or... (laughs) or via our our live stream. It is great to have you join us, and we eagerly look to the day that we can all join back together and meet face-to-face once again. Today, we're going to start off by singing together, and just a, a thought for the day, Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord, to make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness in the night. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord, I sing for joy by what your hands have done. If you're here in the sanctuary with us, let's stand together. As you can see, it's Harvest Shirt Day. Make sure you take a picture and post that to whatever you want to. Let's do some singing together. One, two, three. There is an endless song 
echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on. And to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing? Yes, he died for me. 
chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, yes, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am. I'm ready. 
wondrous your redeeming love and how great is your faithfulness at the cross you beckon me draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words so lost in love gently to my knees and I am lost for words so lost in love I'm sweetly broken holy surrender Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, He gave it all for you and for me. That's why we can sing. That's why we can celebrate. That's why we come to Him humbly in prayer. During this time of family prayer, I would encourage you to, to humble yourself before God. Stand, kneel, just bring yourself before the one who gave it all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love that, your love that took you to the cross. Your love that, that held you there until it was finished. Not because you needed to, but God, because you loved us and you wanted us. He knew that we couldn't do it on our own. So you took on human flesh and, and you paid the price that we couldn't pay. God, I, I pray that that would not be lost on us. As we hear it Sunday after Sunday, as, as it becomes just routine, God, I pray that it wouldn't, that it wouldn't become routine, that it, it would have the same impact today as it did the first time that we heard it. God, your love is so amazing. Your, your love is it's humbling. That even when we wanted nothing to do with you, God, you, you reached down to us. And God, you're still doing that. When we try to do things on our own, when we try to figure things out and, and exclude you from our lives, God, you are still there. You are still loving and you're still caring. God, we come to you. Because God, we need you. God, we, we need your power and your love in our lives. God, continue to help us through this pandemic. As there are still some who are who are staying at home, those who are, are keeping their distance for fear that things are going to spread and there are those who are chomping at the bit to, to get out and to, to get back to work and to do normal life. God, I pray that you would meet us where we are. That you would give us your, your boldness and your courage but that you'd also give us your safety and your protection. God, I pray that as we're living in this new normal that we would not forget who we are in you. God, that we wouldn't forget that we are still your church, that we still have a mission to reach out to people, to show people your love and your mercy, that it wasn't just for us in the church, but it was for everybody, for all who would, who would receive the sacrificial blood of Jesus, the cleansing blood that can make us clean, can make us new. God, may we not just hold up within our home, but may we be reaching out to the community in which you've placed us to be your light, to bind, build, and bring, to, to draw people to you because of your love. Because your love compels us to love others. Be with us. 
be with us today, God. As we're in our living rooms or wherever we may be gathered, God, may your spirit fall upon that room. May your presence be felt. May we know that we've had an encounter with you. God, may we be hearers and doers. Open our hearts that we may receive what you have for us. We may put it into practice that we may live this life for you and, and with you. Be with us today, God. Our Lord and Savior. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Growing up, there's a general piece of advice that I heard over and over. In your regular conversations, there were three things that you just didn't talk about. Money, politics, and religion. Money, I could only assume, was because it's, it's going to make people feel uncomfortable. If you have money, well, then you don't really want to brag about it. You don't want to push that upon other people, and so you, you kind of stay away from the topic so as to not put yourself out there. If you don't have money, well, then any conversation about money is only, only going to remind you that you don't have money. It's only going to remind you of the pile of bills and how you have struggled in this area of life. Politics, well, politics. We all know why we don't talk about politics. Especially in our, in our country today, politics is so polarizing. Where we have one group that's angry and yelling, orange man bad, and, and the other group that's yelling, the communists are coming. It's hard to, to find a, a middle ground to, to come together. And if you're not careful in these conversations, the conversation is going to be over even before it starts. These are conversations that need to happen. We need to talk about these things. In fact, I think the, the polarization in our country today is because we haven't talked about them. But what we need to be able to do is come to the table with those of, of differing views, seeking to understand where they're coming from rather than immediately vilifying them. And when we do that, we may not come to an agreement. We may not change perspectives or, or change our mind on issues, but we will understand the person. We will understand their heart and where they're coming from and why they hold the views that they do. But then there's religion. Religion, I think it's, it's a tough topic because most people have already made up their minds or they already think that they've made up their minds. They've selected a, a religion, or lack thereof, that makes them feel good, and they don't want someone to tell them that they're wrong. They don't want people to begin poking holes in what they believe. Because these beliefs that we hold, they, they influence so many different areas of our lives that if, if we change the way that we think or we change what we believe, the, the shifts in our life, it, it's scary. We don't want to deal with that if we don't have to. But this, this goes to highlight our, our misunderstanding of what religion is. The Bible is arguably the most influential religious book of all time. But you may be surprised to hear that throughout the entirety of the Bible, there are only five verses that talk about religion or that, that use this word religion. 
And they all come from three different Greek words, and sometimes they're not even translated as religion, but instead as worship. If we expound that to include the word religious, we get a few more, but, but only a handful of verses. And in these, it's exclusively talking about the, the religious feasts or festivals or the activities that are performed and not the beliefs that are held. And this is the misunderstanding of religion. We get this idea that religion is a system of beliefs, but religion is not beliefs. Religion is doing it is putting into action those beliefs. It's not so much the believing as much as it is what you do with those beliefs. It's the outward practice of those beliefs. It's the acts of service toward God. And this is what James is talking about in James chapter 1, verse 26. We've been looking through the book of James, and, and throughout the first chapter, James has been telling us, we talked about last week, that we, not need, that we need to more than just hear what God is saying. We need to do more than, than hear the word, but we need to put it into practice. We need to do what it says. And so we come to James 1.26, where he says, If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue... His religion is useless, and he deceives himself. Now, given our understanding of religion, given what we've been talking about, how James has been talking about hearing and doing, this verse looks different today than it may have a month ago. I was reading a blog post this past week by a speaker named Jason Johnson. And in the blog post, he sought to to dissect, to, to better understand a scripture verse by expounding upon it, by, by paraphrasing it or, or rephrasing it with what we know about what it's saying. And I think our scripture today is a good candidate for that. So as we begin to look at James 1.26, he says, if anyone thinks he is religious. Now we've already talked about what religion is. Religion isn't the beliefs. Religion is the action. It, it's the doing. And so we can rework that. We can rephrase that by saying if anyone thinks he's living out his faith without controlling his tongue. Now, this idea of controlling the tongue, it's one that James is going to come back to. It's, it's more of an example here. It, it's not an exclusive application where James is saying it's only about the tongue. It's only about the tongue. I, I think anything could be substituted here as long as it, it goes contrary to the first part of the verse. It's a, a common theme. It, it's something that James had on his mind that he really wanted to push, but it wasn't exclusive to this. So we could say if anyone thinks he's living out his faith, but isn't doing what he knows is right. And then we come back to religion again. He's not really living for God, but merely fooling himself. Yikes. As we understand the, the context of this, as, as we rework that into something more easily digested, it carries the exact same message that James was talking about just a few verses earlier. We need to not only hear, but we need to do. And if we aren't doing, we're only fooling ourselves. If we're doing the church stuff, but we're not living out our faith, if we're looking in the mirror but not doing anything about what we see. We're only fooling ourselves. This idea of, of doing, of putting our religion into practice, it's, it's a common theme throughout James' letter. But let's move on to verse 27. In, in verse 26, James basically told us, this is what fake religion looks like. 
But in verse 27, he goes on to say, this is what it should look like. He says, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now, this is a popular verse in foster care and, and adoptive community circles. It's one that, that is brought up quite frequently. Just like any strong conviction where you feel this is who we need to be, this is what we should be doing, one of the first things you do is to get someone to back you up, to get somebody with authority to agree with you. And in order to do that in Scripture, you, you begin Googling Bible verses that talk about orphans. Or if you're really old school, you break out that big dusty book called the Concordance, and you, you look through there to find all the places where the word orphan is used in the Bible. And whichever route you take, you're going to land on this verse. I've preached on this verse. I've, I've talked about it, and, and I, I preached what it says right there on the surface. If you love God, take care of the orphans and the widows. But as we dig into it, there's more to this verse than just what's on the surface. Because that's not exactly what it says. What it says is pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. This isn't a command. It's not saying, if you love me, you have to do this. It's a description. It's saying, this is what it's going to look like. This is what you're striving for. So let's take a moment and just like with verse 26, let's, let's paraphrase. Let's rewrite this verse so that we can get a better understanding of, of what's actually being said. And we start with the word pure. It comes from the Greek word katharos. And it's this idea of being physically or ceremoniously clean. It's actually the word that we get our, our modern word cathartic. If you're in the medical field, this is probably a familiar word. We, we use this word to describe medical practices or, or procedures or, or medicines even that are designed to, to purge or, or to cleanse impurities from the human body. A laxative would be cathartic. If you have a liver problem and you need dialysis, that is cathartic. It cleanses the impurities. And then we get back to religion. Here he gives it the qualifier, religion before God the Father. Now that adds to it, but I think it's more to, to narrow things down. It, it doesn't really hold a whole lot of additional significance other than to say, I'm not talking about the Norse gods. I'm not talking about the Greek gods. The gods, the, the religion that I'm talking about is the same religion that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 28, where he said, go and make disciples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The religion that we're talking about is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so as, as we take just this first part and, and paraphrase it, remembering this is not a command. James is describing what this looks like. We come up with something that says the cleanest and purest demonstration of the gospel message is to look after. And some translations may say to care for. It's important that we understand what's, what's being said here. Because we look after a whole lot of things. Something that you should probably know about me is I, I don't like to sit by idle. I always want to be doing something. That something could be as simple as watching TV or playing a game on my phone. Or it could be doing laundry or, or sweeping the floor, doing some project around the house. I want to keep busy. I want to do something. As my kids have grown up, it's, 
It's become easier that I can do other things. But I still have a two-year-old. And recently, as the weather has gotten nicer, he has discovered the joy of being outside. Now, we have a fenced-in backyard, so we're able to, to let him enjoy the great outdoors within the safety of our backyard. But we also have a dog. And so the backyard is not always the safest or cleanest place for him to play. And so my wife has set up a, a toddler slide in the front yard, and he absolutely loves it, and he wants to, to go out there and play. And there are times when I go out there too because somebody has to watch him. Somebody has to make sure that he's not going to go running down the street after some random stray animal or, or get hurt or, or something like that. And so I go out there to, to keep an eye on him, to, to look out for him, to watch over him. But I don't want to sit idle. I also don't want to be one of those parents that ignores their children and is sucked into their phone. And so I try to find something to do while I'm out there. I, I'll work on fixing bicycles or I'll do yard work, trim the bushes, pull weeds, whatever. I want to do something. And many times I can do something while watching him. I can work on a bicycle or trim the bushes and, you know, I'll, I'll occasionally turn around and glance and I, I see where he is and what he's doing and making sure he's not getting into trouble. You know, I can watch him from a distance while doing something else. I can watch him but not be engaged in what he's doing. But as we come back to what James is talking about here, the original word that he is using here. It's not talking about that, that watching without engaging. What James is talking about, the, this original word gives the, the, the connotation of, of laying eyes upon, but, but more so to inspect, to examine, to give intense attention to. You have those different groups of friends in your lives. Those groups of friends that, well, you are Facebook friends. You, you care about what's going on in their lives. You may go months, maybe even years without talking to them, but you'll check in and, and catch up every once in a while. You'll, you'll see what's going on online. But then you also have those friends that you are intimately involved with. Those friends that they don't get a head cold without you knowing about it that you are engaged in their lives. And this is what James is talking about. Thus, we could say that the cleanest and purest demonstration of the gospel message is to become involved with the orphans and the widows. Again, this is a, a favorite in the foster care and adoptive communities. We really like this verse. But this verse is, it's not a command. It's more descriptive. James is trying to, to paint a picture of, of what this religion, what this demonstration of the gospel message looks like. Thus, the orphans and the widows, they're, they're representative of the marginalized groups. And in James's culture and society, the these were the people that had no legacy. They were the people that made no contribution to society. And as such, they were often pushed to the side. They were often neglected and forgotten. They are used as a representation. It's not prescriptive, a command that says, no, it's only these. In fact, if we were to ask James, if we were to be able to sit down and talk to him about this and say, James, but what about, what about the victims of human trafficking? James, what about the homeless people? What about those who are, are in our city struggling with addiction? What about parents who are in crisis or, or even my next door neighbor who is struggling with this, that, or whatever? James isn't going to say, no. I said widows and orphans, just the widows and orphans. What don't you get? What was unclear about what I said? 
I was going to say, yes. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Those people too. That's where we need to go. Those are our people. The people who are broken and in hard places. And then we come to the last portion of this verse. And this portion is many times left off. Sometimes because it doesn't, it, it's used to, to emphasize the former. Other times, I think we just don't know what to do with it. We don't know how it fits into the big picture of, of everything that's being said. James says to keep unstained by the world. And some will look at that and they'll say, well, that means that we need to separate ourselves. We need to seclude ourselves from the rest of society. But I think we misunderstand what he's saying. In order to really understand, we need to understand one word in particular, and that is the word world. World is a tricky word to understand and interpret in Scripture because it has so many different meanings. And in order to understand it, we have to look at the context in which it's being used. Because there are some times when we use the word world and we're talking about the planet Earth, the, the world on which we stand, when God created the world. Well, there are other times where world refers to the people. It refers to the human race. For God so loved the world. It's not that God really loved this planet. God really loves the, the minerals and the, and the oil under the surface of the earth. No. God loved the people. But then we also have the moral world. This is the world that we talk about when we say that Satan is the prince of this world. And in this world, we're not talking about all people. What we're talking about is anything and everything that is indifferent or hostile toward God. That's the world that James is talking about here. Not that we need to go it alone and, and we can't interact with any other people or, or we need to separate ourselves from the earth and go live on the moon. No, we're talking about this Hostility toward God and the prince of darkness. But this verse, it, it should be a no-brainer. I mean, we're supposed to do good things. We're supposed to help other people. That's what's being said. There, there really shouldn't be anything too difficult about that. But the truth is, in pursuit of helping others, sometimes that line gets blurred. Sometimes what is good and right can be difficult to see. This is the case with Edward Jenner. He performed medical experiments upon healthy children in order to produce the smallpox vaccine. The same story of Jonas Salk, who did medical experiments upon his own healthy children in order to cure polio. We've heard the story of Robin Hood, who stole from the rich to give to the poor. All of these men are deemed to be heroes who have done good things. But the ends don't justify the means. That's what I believe James is saying here. You can do all these good things, you can, you can make good things happen. You can help other people, but at what cost? We are to draw near to others. We are to help others. But we are to do so without falling prey to the moral world. Without becoming disillusioned, without becoming jaded, without sacrificing our morals, because the end justifies the means. We are to help other people, but to keep ourselves unstained. Thus, our final paraphrase looks something like this. 
If anyone thinks he's living out his faith, but isn't doing what he knows is right, he's not really living for God, but merely fooling himself. The cleanest and purest demonstration of the gospel message is to become involved with broken people in hard places without compromising what is good and right. This is true religion before God the Father. The outward reflection of God's love working in and through us. It's not just that we'll do good things. It's not just that we will help those who are in need, but that we will do so without compromising the righteousness of God. That we will love our neighbor selflessly. That we will sacrifice ourselves for their good in the process. All while maintaining the purity of and the cleanliness that has been imparted to us by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what James is saying here. That's what he's been getting at. That is pure religion, the demonstration of the gospel message. That is practical Christianity. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would get it. We come to church and we, we do all the, the religious stuff. But God, we're not doing it for you. God, help us to help us to really get religion. This living out of our faith, this hearing and doing. That we would care. For the widows, the orphans, the, the drug addicts, the, the people who have fallen on hard times, the, our neighbor who is struggling. God, help us to understand what it means to be your ambassadors here on earth. God, keep us from being unstained. As we continue to, to peer into the reflection of your word, help us to see who we are that we can do all these good things, that we can help all these people, that we can live out this faith without becoming stained and, and tainted, without sacrificing what is good and what is right. Go with us this week, God, and show us. Show us what we need to do. Show us who we need to be. Show us how to live out our faith. That we may have this pure and undefiled religion, that we may have this deep, connected relationship with you. Go before us, God, we pray, in the matchless and holy and, and perfect name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week.